Joining us now on the line from Columbia, Missouri, Bruce Bartholo. He is associate professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences at the University of Missouri. And Bruce, we're happy to have you on the program. How are you tonight? Thanks. I'm doing well, Steve. And you? Good to hear. Very good. Thank you as well. But I want to know if I start playing a lot of video games, whether my mood will change. So let's look into this and get your view on this to start with. Do violent video games desensitize the user to violence in your view? In my view, yes, and that's not just my opinion, but that's based on the scientific research that we've done in my lab and also others have done in, uh, in other labs in the U.S. and other places. What's the most compelling piece of evidence you can share with us? Well, you know, the whole concept of desensitization really is the idea that uh, an initially negative response to something uh, becomes less negative over time with repeated exposure. And so when we talk about desensitization to violence, what we're talking about is a reduction in the body and in the mind in uh, uh, the kind of negative responses that people initially have when they see blood and gore and violence. Uh, and there are a number of studies now uh, showing that if you randomly assign uh, research subjects to play a violent video game compared to another group who uh, play a nonviolent game, and then you measure some kind of physiological response uh, that they have to viewing real scenes of violence, uh, what you find is that the, the folks who have just played the violent game will show a, a decrease in their physiological response to violence and also a, a more kind of lax attitude towards violence. Uh, and uh, they're also, uh, in some studies, less likely to help an injured person, things along those lines. All of those things are associated with the idea that they're being desensitized to violence. Well, that is watching, though, and not doing. So is this anything we really need to be concerned about? Well, in fact, it is. And part of the reason is that, uh, well, we've known, you know, really going back at least 40 or 50 years that even passive viewing of, of violence in the media uh, is associated with increases in aggressive behavior. Uh, and we're a little more concerned, in fact, about video games because uh, they're actually an active uh, kind of interface instead of just passively viewing television and movies. And so the, the participants or the individuals who play the games are actively engaging in uh, a virtual form of violence when they play the games. What about this notion that humans are, by nature, aggressive? And this is a harmless, a harmless outlet for that aggression. What do you say to that? Well, you know, that's an old idea going back to Sigmund Freud, uh, really his notion of catharsis. Uh, unfortunately, despite that, uh, the intuitive appeal of that idea, uh, the science just doesn't back it up. It's, it's really a myth that by venting uh, anger and aggression that people become less angry and aggressive. Uh, in fact, there's uh, experimental evidence from uh, a number of labs indicating that the opposite is in fact true, that when people are given the opportunity to behave aggressively, they, they just tend to become more aggressive, not less. Hmm. And if, let's say, a group of people were to play these violent video games, how long were you able to measure? How long the effects of that actually lasted? Well, in, uh, in a recent study that I did with a, a former graduate student of mine named Mark Sester, uh, we found that the short-term effect of a single exposure to a video game is, is really quite short, maybe on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, but what we're more concerned about is more the cumulative effect of repeated multiple exposures. So uh, I think there's, uh, there are two issues at play. One is what are the immediate short-term effects and then what are the kind of longer-term effects that result from more chronic exposure. Let's follow up on that then. Let's say you're a 15-year-old boy, because it tends to be boys, I guess, who's playing some kind of very violent, lots of blood and guts kind of video game, and you do it an hour a day, five days a week for a year. What kind of after effects mm -hmm. are we talking about? Well, first of all, Steve, an hour a day would be short by the, by the standards of what we know actually happens. Uh, most kids that age these days are playing much longer than that. Uh, the average uh, media exposure in, in teenagers, at least in the U.S., is about 40 hours a week. Um, but we would expect that after a year's worth of exposure, uh, there would be some long-lasting, long-term effects in terms of both increases in the likelihood of behaving aggressively, hostile feelings, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the data on that is still a little bit limited as far as what are the long-term longitudinal consequences, but there are some scientists now studying that issue. Bruce, though, would, would the harmful effects, which you say take place as a result of 
exposure to these kind of violent video games be offset by, say, you know, good old-fashioned tender loving care from parents or girlfriend or something like that? Well, you know, the, the honest answer is nobody knows for sure. Um, but what we're worried about is not so much, uh, you know, that uh, an exposure to a violent video game by itself uh, is going to turn someone into a monster or something like that, but more that it's another factor that helps to contribute to uh, the aggressiveness of someone's personality, which could have long-term consequences, despite other positive effects that they might experience. Okay, let me get you to react to a quote that I'm going to read you now from a guy named Jeffrey Goldstein from Utrecht University. And he wrote the following, what is called video game violence is simulated aggression, different from the real thing in countless ways. Video games cannot reinforce aggressive behavior since players do not engage in any aggressive behavior in the first place. Besides, what is it that is positively reinforced in video games which inevitably result in the defeat of the player's character? What's your reaction to that? Well, my reaction is that, in fact, video games are an excellent tool for teaching violence. Uh, they're, an, they're an excellent tool for teaching whatever their content is. Uh, and they're set up in such a way that they reinforce whatever behaviors are called for in the game. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that this issue about, you know, does virtual aggression that's enacted in a video game somehow relate to real aggression or aggression that's enacted outside the video game context? Uh, the answer to that is, in fact, yes, because of the human capacity for abstract reasoning and abstract thought. Uh, so in other words, you don't have to literally wield a weapon or throw a punch in order to realize that actions like that in the, in the virtual world uh, would translate into real harm. And so the, the idea that somehow people separate uh, you know, virtual violence that's enacted in a game from real world violence uh, is kind of a misnomer. In fact, uh, it's not necessary really for people to even recognize that there's that difference. Uh, what's happening under the surface psychologically is that when people are rewarded in a game, say with more points or extra lives or more health or whatever their characters receive in the games, when they're rewarded in those ways for behaving violently, in fact, people are learning uh, to behave violently. I really have to follow up on that because, you know, I, I have talked to a lot of kids about this myself and, and they all say, look, at, we don't confuse uh, being aggressive towards a video screen with being aggressive in real life. Uh, they say they just don't, even with the kind of exposure that, you know, you referred to earlier, uh, many hours, a 40 right. hours a week, I think you said. So c can we right. really say that, that uh, even very young children don't understand the difference between, you know, the screen and reality? No, they do understand the difference. Uh, that's not really my point. My point is that despite understanding the difference, people are affected in ways that they may not be aware of. Uh, you know, the whole history of, of research on cognitive psychology is basically that there are uh, effects of environmental stimuli that people are exposed to all the time that they're not aware of. Uh, so we don't need to kind of put it together consciously that there is some difference or there is no difference. Uh, what's going on under the surface is, uh, you know, unconsciously people are being affected in ways that they probably don't realize, and uh, therefore it's hard for them to even understand, you know, what's happening. Okay, fair enough, but are there any positive consequences or ramifications from playing these video games? Well, as I said before, it, it really depends on the content of the game. So there certainly are benefits to, to playing video games in terms of, uh, you know, recent research showing evidence for uh, attentional benefits in some cases, uh, certain kinds of cognitive benefits in terms of motor skills and so on. Uh, and certainly there are lots of video games that don't have a violent theme. And uh, as I said before, any video game can be an excellent teaching tool. It's just a matter of what's being taught. And so if the game has a pro-social theme where the object is to help uh, or to somehow assist other characters, then that could have a very positive pro-social benefit for the player. I appreciate that. But, but for example, I, I remember talking to, uh, well, I'll, I'll fess up about this. My 13-year-old son, uh, who suddenly was um, dropping names of World War II battles that uh, he was aware of, that I had never heard of, and he kind of, just through osmosis, through playing this what looked to me like a pretty violent video game, he was starting to learn a lot about World War II history. Uh, 
I wasn't keen on the first sure. part of that, but I, w I was quite keen on the mm -hmm. fact that he was learning a bit of history while he was playing. I mean, surely that's a positive benefit from playing one of these blood and guts games, isn't it? Well, certainly, you know, uh, and uh, I certainly value that aspect of, uh, of any kind of video game. If there's a, a learning component, uh, you know, history is wonderful to learn about, but I guess at what cost is the other question. Uh, you know, could your son learn the same thing by reading books about World War II uh, where he may not experience some of the, uh, the negative benefits too? Just for the record, in case he's watching, he does that too. Just so you know, Bruce. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we, uh, we also refer to the top that it's almost always boys who are doing this. Do, do you have any data on whether or not, you, you know, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 year old girls play these kind of shoot 'em up games as well? They're starting to, yes. Uh, used to be pretty exclusively boys, uh, as you said, but in fact, uh, in the last 10 years or so, uh, we're finding that uh, girls are playing almost as much as boys now. Uh, and so uh, one of the interesting questions that we've often tried to address in some of our work is, are the effects of video games different for boys than they are for girls? Uh, and in some of our earlier work, we did find that uh, there were some differences. But overall, when you look across the entire body of scientific uh, evidence, uh, it turns out that there really are no gender differences. So girls are also affected by the games, just like boys are. How about whether there are any differences between teenagers or adults? Uh, again, uh, not really. There seems to be uh, some indication in theory that there should be a greater cause for concern uh, with teenagers because their brains are still developing. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, the, the parts of the brain that have something to do with controlling impulses, for example, are the, the frontal lobes of the brain. That part of the brain is still undergoing significant uh, neural development during the teenage years. And so one question that, that I have as a scientist is, uh, to what extent does repeated exposure to media violence during those years alter in some way the, the formation of that part of the, of the brain? Uh, we just don't know the answer to that question yet, but I think it's an excellent one. You know, there's probably a bunch of people watching us right now who want me to ask, does this guy have any kids himself? So how about it, Bruce, do you? <laughs> I sure do. I have two boys. How old? One is 14 years old, and the other is just about to turn one year old. Ah, okay. Well, the one year old, I don't imagine this is an issue for him yet, but for the 14 year old, what's, your, what's your rules about whether he's allowed to play video games? He plays a lot of video games. Uh, we've bought him uh, a number of video games uh, each year. We get him the updates for all the sports games that he likes and so on. Uh, so, yes, my son plays video games, uh, but we don't buy him any violent games. Uh, that's just kind of the bottom line at my house. Okay. Now, I realize that when, when my son maybe goes to a friend's house uh, and uh, that friend uh, may have violent games, he's, he's probably playing those as well. I, I, don't, I don't fool myself about that. Does he talk but to you about it? what we can do is just, uh, once in a while, yeah. Uh, and I talk to him about it, and, and I tell him, you know, that if it's uh, very occasional, I'm not as worried about it. Uh, he's not one of the kinds of kids that I would be worried about who are playing, you know, four or five hours a day, very violent games every day. But you have not found so far, at any rate, the need to put in place some very strict rules about this amount of time, this number of days of the week, that kind of thing? Not per se, again, because he, uh, he spends uh, most of his time at our house playing nonviolent games. Uh, we certainly limit his exposure to the games in total in terms of, you know, well, after you've played for an hour, it's time to do your homework, that kind of thing. Um, but when he's at our house, he never plays any violent games. Yeah, Bruce, uh, take it from me. Wait till he gets a little older. He'll be getting up at 1 in the morning, sneaking around behind your back and getting to those video games when you're, <laughs> when you're sleeping. Trust me, that's in your future. Uh, let me yeah, ask I'm you sure one last right. thing here, and that is, um, in television, there has long been a focus on producing children's shows that have positive influence, you know, Sesame Street, Electric Company, so on. We haven't... This network plays uh, 13 hours of uh, what they call educational, nonviolent children's programming every day. Uh, there's a history of that in television. Is there any history of that in the video game industry? There is, although it's a small part of the industry. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's, it's certainly worth acknowledging that there are educational and uh, very appropriate games available. Uh, the issue that we're most concerned about is simply that those games tend to be uh, less popular and certainly get less marketing push than the violent games. 
ultimately, it's, it's kind of a money game. And the industry, of course, the companies that make games are ultimately uh, interested in, in their profits. And so to the extent that educational games can be pushed and be made to be uh, popular, uh, then they could maybe make some more money off of those games. Um, so certainly, they have that opportunity. And I hope that that starts to happen some more. Gotcha. Bruce, thanks so much for joining us on the line from the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Appreciate your time tonight. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.